Thank you, Chris. Um, so if I could have the first slide. Um, great, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, lawyers, law firms and their responsibilities uh, in relation to human rights um, under the UN guiding principles um, and in the context of advising on land transactions and agricultural investment. Um, you can see on the slide there the guide that I authored for UNFAO, who are now producing a series of legal guides. Um, this looks in detail at this issue, so um, the references that I'll uh, refer to this evening, you can find more detail in the guide, and I think there may be a link, or there will be a link after the event, so you can uh, get your own copy. Um, the, the key issue for lawyers, I think, under the UNGP, including in this sector, is that they have dual responsibilities. Law firms are obviously businesses in their own right. So when they're advising business clients, they have two sets of responsibilities. They have to provide support to their business clients to ensure that those clients, investors and others, meet their responsibilities um, to respect human rights. But the law firms have to have their own internal processes and policies in place as businesses themselves to ensure that they also uh, meet their responsibilities. So I'm going to look at how those dual responsibilities interrelate and what they mean for the law firm. Uh, part, the guide is in three parts. Part one is an introduction with some of the context talking about um, the uh, international framework for looking at tenure, both the soft law instruments and the human rights uh, standards. Um, the second part looks specifically at uh, lawyers' responsibilities under the UNGP, and the third part looks in more detail at due diligence. So the core responsibility is clearly to respect human rights under UNGP 11. Um, I think it's important to flag up that this is a fast developing area. Although the human rights standards are long and well established and the subject of binding treaties and uh, evolving jurisprudence, there is, I think, an increasing focus on two things that are relevant for this evening, land and human rights and business and human rights. Uh, and this is illustrated perhaps by the fact that the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights is currently consulting on a new general comment on land and the covenant. And as you can see, they are specifically addressing the question, what is the role of emerging human rights responsibilities of businesses, including investors, uh, in relation to due diligence uh, in order to ensure the investment doesn't negatively affect human rights. And that is in the context of land. So moving to the next slide, thank you. I think it's important to start um, discussion by looking at the core obligations and perhaps starting with UNGP 13. So for law firms and their business clients, what is it that they actually have to ensure that they do? Well, they have to avoid causing or contributing to adverse impacts through their own activities and address these where they occur. And they have to seek to prevent or mitigate adverse human rights impacts that are directly linked to their services. And I think it might be natural for law firms to assume that really, for their own part, it's the second paragraph that is relevant rather than the first. Um, but I think that's a mistake. I don't think there is a hard, bright line between these two paragraphs, uh, and as you will know if you uh, looked at the UNGP in detail, there are different consequences that flow um, from breach of either of these. But for law firms, I think they have to consider both. It, it may be difficult to imagine that the law firm would cause or contribute to adverse impacts, but I think that's fact sensitive. It depends what has happened in a particular situation, how um, the level of cult culpability will depend on how inadequate uh, uh, conduct was, whether it was any collusion, can't be disregarded as a risk, I think. Although it may be more natural to look at um, systems to help prevent and mitigate rights, uh, sorry, prevent and mitigate uh, impact, um, both those aspects of UNGP 13 are relevant and should be considered when the law firm does its own internal reviews. So um, I'll look briefly at some operational implications just to illustrate the point, if we could go to the next slide. 
obviously these are just examples. Um, there are many situations that could arise. And the point of raising these here is really to say these are the risks that the law firm should consider when it's looking at its own internal policies and processes uh, in the context of the work that it does with business clients, including investors in um, ag agribusiness development and land transactions. So law firms need to look at these potential scenarios in order to ensure that their own processes are fit for purpose. So thinking about G UNGP 13, if a law firm were to deliberately or knowingly omit uh, consideration of uh, tenure rights and associated human rights when advising on a large scale land acquisition, I think it's, there's clearly a risk that it won't meet its own responsibilities. And obviously there's also a risk that the client uh, will not meet its own responsibilities. And similarly, if the law firm fails to address pre prior informed consent rights during advice or conduct of human rights due diligence, again, it's hard to see how the lawyer can ensure that either the law firm itself or its client is meeting its responsibility to seek to prevent or mitigate risks or even to avoid contributing to them. And thirdly, um, and this is another important area that I'll come back to uh, again, to um, if the law firm has no system in place to respond to um, a situation where there is harassment uh, of human rights defenders or communities in the context of a transaction or an investment that they are advising on, it is difficult to see how they can meet their responsibilities and similarly that the client can meet its responsibilities. So these are just three scenarios that I think should be um, considered by law firms when they are looking at their own systems and processes. Uh, next slide, please. So one issue that's important, I think, uh, to consider and which is addressed in the guide is the relationship between the soft law instruments that um, set out the standards and best practice for looking at governance of tenure, land rights and related issues. There are a number of those and binding human rights law. And one of the main instruments, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with, are the 2012 voluntary guidelines on responsible governance of tenure of land, uh, fisheries and forests in the context of national food security, which are commonly referred to as the BGGT. So the guide looks at these and other soft law instruments in some detail. But what is the relationship between these soft law instruments and human rights law? Well, breach of the standards laid down in those guidelines is not per se a breach of human rights law. They are declared to be voluntary and non-binding, but they are to be interpreted consistently with international law, including human rights law. But if there is a breach of those standards and those guidelines refer to the protection of legitimate tenure rights and um, consequential um, protections related to that, it may indicate that there is a breach of human rights law occurring or that a breach is likely because the impact of that breach may lead or be likely to lead to breach of specific human rights. So for example, if there is a failure to recognize customary rights of tenure or to address that in advice, uh, this may lead to forced evictions or loss of livelihood, uh, and this may constitute breaches of rights to uh, adequate standard of living, rights to food, or even rights to health, loss of life, and so on. Um, so there is a close relationship between dispossession of tenure rights and the risk and occurrence of human rights violations. So in the guide, the reference is usually to a breach of tenure rights and associated human rights. So trying to keep those two things in mind. Uh, and bearing in mind, there are a number of key principles that are relevant and non-discrimination is perhaps a particularly important one in the context of land investment because of the well-documented um, vulnerability of marginalized groups, vulnerable communities, uh, and also women where they don't have um, security of tenure. So that principle, as well as others, should inform uh, all legal work in this area. Uh, next slide, please. So coming back to the lawyer's role, and bearing in mind there is obviously, there are specific professional duties, as we all know, that lawyers have, uh, and that they must continue to act within. So how do they reconcile those with the responsibilities of uh, their law firm uh, uh, under the UNGP? 
Well, this issue has been addressed by the International Bar Association at some length. It issued guidance in 2016, uh, um, both a practical guide and a longer reference annex that look at these uh, issues in some detail. And uh, the guide that, I, that I've been involved in references that uh, extensively in part two. There are three concepts I think that are uh, relevant here that, are, uh, that help to understand how to reconcile these two sets of obligations. One is the role of the wise counsellor. So rather than simply being a technical expert on black letter law, the wise counsellor proactively identifies and advises on potential legal risks that may, may arise in the future and on the wider context. Uh, and this, is, this role is broader than this sector. It has been picked up by national professional bodies, including the Law Society and the American Bar Association. Um, and in this sector, I think the wise counsellor will advise clients of the trend for national legislation on due diligence, on the emerging standards for uh, land tenure and the relationship with human rights, and so on. So that is the sort of thing that a wise counsellor in this sector will uh, integrate into their work. The other important concept is leverage. Leverage is a, a concept that is referenced in the UNGP as well as in the IPA guidance. This is obviously the influence the firm has, the advisor has to effect change uh, where there are uh, risks of wrongful or harmful practices. Uh, and the uh, IBA guidance encourages lawyers to, uh, to use their leverage. Law firms obviously are in a prime position to exercise leverage because they are usually advising on risk. They certainly should be. So in a sense, they're probably professionally bound to exercise their leverage to that degree. What if things uh, are, go seriously wrong? What if you're advising a client who will not uh, take on board the advice that you've given uh, in the context of human rights um, due diligence or even at a, a prior stage? Well, the IBA guide um, talks about withdrawing from a, a legal um, relationship of legal services, but only as a last resort and where permitted under professional rules where a severe negative impact has occurred uh, and the, the client um, will not respond to the advice. So this is obviously a difficult area, but it is addressed in the IPA guidance. I think it's important to, to think about the fact that the UN guiding principles described their responsibilities as obligations of conduct, but to remember that outcomes, of course, are evidence of the extent to which conduct is meeting those standards. So in this case, if a law firm is um, associated with a series of transactions for a client or a succession of clients where there are human rights violations, um, it raises a question, I think, uh, as to the conduct of the firm itself. What, what are its internal processes? It may be that, you know, the firm has done everything that it could possibly have done, but I think it's important to, for the firm to monitor this so that it can review its policies and processes and um, show that they are robust uh, in delivering these standards of conduct. And for lawyers as individuals, for all of us as professionals, I think it's important to ask oneself the question similar to the one I've, I've put there. If you're not sure um, in your professional life uh, whether your firm uh, is, is sufficiently equipped to deal with these questions, Start by asking yourself, what are the consequences of my actions as a professional lawyer and the actions of the firm, and that includes failure to act, on the human rights of those impacted by this investment or transaction? If you can think about the consequences and you can see that your firm has the processes in place to help you navigate this area, then that's good. If you feel that you're not clear about how these two things fit together, it may be appropriate to raise this um, and see if the firm can improve its internal processes. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just briefly um, look at human rights due diligence. This is uh, looked at extensively in part three of the guide and is the subject of um, a wide range of technical guidance produced by UNFAO and others, which again is referenced in the guide. Um, uh, and so I won't go into the detail of it here. But looking at the purpose of human rights due diligence, it's to identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for 
how a business addresses its adverse impacts. So both the law firm and the business client should conduct human rights due diligence. This is part of the sort of dual responsibilities of law firms. Assessing impacts, acting upon findings, tracking responses, and importantly, communicating. Human rights due diligence has been described as a know and show process. And I think that, that applies to law firms uh, as well as to their business clients. So the law firm should be able to, to disclose what processes it has in place, at least in general terms, to meet these standards. Um, the guide makes a number of recommendations. I'll just briefly refer to some of them. Um, the first one is that law firms may wish to review their internal policies to ensure that these address explicitly the protection of tenure rights and associated human rights. If you don't do that, sometimes this area of human rights is perhaps not as um, prominent or not as much of a focus as other areas, for example, modern slavery. But if you've said that we will address human rights in this area, that in itself, I think, helps to refine and focus policies and processes. Um, you can see the other recommendations there, um, advising clients on the human rights implications of the range of soft law instruments that are available, including the BGGT um, and the other principles that are looked at in the guide and addressing free prior informed consent, which I know Lucy is going to address in more detail. Um, again, there's a lot of international work on drafting contracts in this sector. UNIDRA are working on this at the moment, and I think hoping to conclude an extensive guide on this by the end of the year. Um, and again, I think as an example of the focus that's now being placed on professionals, including lawyers, the voluntary guidelines specifically state that professionals who provide services should undertake due diligence, irrespective of whether it is specifically requested. So I would see this as part of the trend of spotlight on those providing services, which would include lawyers. Next slide, please. I wanted to come back to a really important aspect of the UN guiding principles, which is the business responsibility to treat the risk of causing or contributing to gross human rights abuses as a legal compliance issue wherever the business operates. As I said earlier, I don't think there is a clear, hard, bright line between causing and contributing and failing to prevent uh, or mitigate. So the, the precautionary approach would be the firm has to take this on board. I think two important areas are in relation to defenders, where there are well-documented cases of increasing or increasingly recorded um, abuses of human rights and environmental defenders. Um, you can see the global witness report there, and of course there, there are many others, and forced evictions. There's quite extensive um, guidance on avoiding forced evictions in the FAO technical guides to which my guide refers. Um, so these are two of the key areas, I think, where the firm needs to consider what it does when these uh, risks related to these areas arise. Bearing in mind that in 2016, the International Criminal Court adopted a policy that it would investigate land grabbing as a potential crime against humanity. In order to address these risks with the client, but also from the point of view of the law firm itself, um, it's necessary clearly to have a rapid response process with clear lines of uh, clear reporting lines and adequate deployment of resources and expertise so that any possibility of these risks can be identified preemptively and addressed uh, as before they really have time to materialize. Um, Next slide, thank you. The guide doesn't deal with the liability or consequences uh, for law firms of failing to comply with the UNGP. But I think it's important to say that, as I said earlier, this is an area of increasing focus. So the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has called on state parties to consider imposing criminal or administrative sanctions where business activities result in abuses of human rights under the covenant or whether they fail to act with due diligence to mitigate risks. Uh, and this could involve also revoking business licenses or other forms of state support. And it calls on states to regularly review this area. And to sort of finish on a slightly more positive note, I think in all of these contexts, there is an opportunity for law, to, law firms now to showcase best practice, to actually conduct these internal processes in this sector and to, to show that they have 
thought about these. They may already have done this, of course, but to make sure that their processes and lines of accountability are, um, are ready to deal with these risks as they arise. And that in that way, they can provide the right service for their business clients and meet their responsibilities to respect human rights. And I will finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Very interesting indeed. And I know there's, there's already a, a really good question come through from Joss Saunders that will hold <laughs> over until the question and answer session. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a good one. So for other people who have questions, uh, either following Kate's uh, presentation or during Lucy's, please do type in the questions because uh, we, we've made sure we're going to allow some time at the end to deal with those. Uh, but let, let's move swiftly on. Lucy, uh, over to you to tell us about your experience from the Forest People's Programme. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris and Kate. So my presentation will focus on um, agribusiness um, from the perspective of indigenous peoples. So giving some context as to some of the problems that can arise um, and also some, some examples. So uh, just a quick overview of Forest People's Programme. We are an international human rights organization. Uh, we work with forest peoples in 20 countries across South and Central America. Africa and Asia, and we work to secure their rights to their lands and their livelihoods. So we represent uh, indigenous peoples and work with forest communities around the tropical forest, forest belt. And we're very uh, rooted in, on the ground, working with 60, up to 60 local partner organizations. And our activities focus around advocacy, around strategic litigation and other capacity building projects. My role within FPP uh, is heading up, as Chris mentioned, the Strategic Legal Response Centre. And uh, this is aiming to intensify and expand the availability of legal support um, to Indigenous and forest communities. Um, we're very pleased to be exploring collaboration with Lawyers Against Poverty around the provision of a legal advice hotline. Um, so we're grateful for that. So moving on, just to give a bit of background context um, around land tenure, facts, uh, facts and facts and figures. So um, as you may well know, much of the world's land is held communally by indigenous peoples and, and other communities under systems of traditional and collective land ownership. Um, it's difficult to estimate exactly how much of the land is held like this, but the World Bank has, World Bank has estimated approximately 65% of the land area is held um, communally um, and customarily traditionally um, and that represents 80% of the world's biodiversity and that means that there are around 300 million people who traditionally live in forests <clears throat> and primarily depend on them for their livelihoods but against that backdrop only 30% of the world's population has legally registered title to their, their, their land so I think it's quite easy to imagine how land conflicts uh, in agribusiness and other investment projects can arise. And similarly, uh, Kate had mentioned the risk to environmental human rights defenders. So Frontline Defenders uh, has estimated or documented that in 2018, there were 247 murders of environmental defenders. So just to give um, a little bit of perspective. So moving on then, just to look at the principle of free prior and informed consent. I wanted to talk about a little bit about this because it's a very central tenant to Indigenous people's rights. Um, it's a key principle in international law and jurisprudence related to Indigenous peoples. So it's part of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's being recognised in uh, the case law from anti in the Inter-American System, a case called Saramaka, and also um, African human rights systems, the Androids and Ogiet cases as well as other sources of international law, such as general comments from SESCA. And it's actually a principle which FPP advocated for, for, for many years, but it's now become um, a, a, a recognized uh, set of principles. So essentially, it is the principle that the community has the right to give or withhold, withhold its consent to proposed projects that may affect the land that they customarily own, occupy, or otherwise use. So in terms of the, the free, free prior and informed consent, it, this implies informed, non-coercive negotiations between investors, between uh, companies or governments and indigenous peoples. 
and that uh, that negotiation, those negotiations must must take place prior to the development and the establishment of oil palm estates or timber plantations or or any other development of their customary customary lands. So this means that those who wish to use the customary lands belonging to indigenous communities must enter into, into negotiation, negotiations with them. And then I think it's also important to emphasize, because there is some misunderstanding around this, that it's the communities who actually have the right to decide whether they will agree to the project or not. not. And they need to have a full and accurate understanding, for example, in their own language, of all the implications of the project on them and also on their customarily, customary land. Um, and I think it's most commonly uh, believed and interpreted that the principle allows for indigenous peoples to reach consensus and make decisions according to their customary systems of decision making. So as opposed to um, an investor picking off one or two members of the community and negotiating with them, which doesn't respect their traditional leadership systems, uh, customary systems of decision making do need to be respected and that has um, can and has created some problems. So then moving on to the, the next slide, um, the, the right to free prior and informed consent um, can help to ensure a level playing field between communities and government or investors and companies. And where it does result in successful negotiated agreements, it can provide companies with greater security and less risky investments, and similarly respects indigenous people's rights. Um, it's safe to assume, I think, that if free and prior and informed consent principles have been properly followed, it's much more likely that there have been careful participatory impact assessments. There might be benefit sharing agreements in place to, uh, to benefit the indigenous customarily uh, owners of their land. But on, on the flip side, there can um, be problems and, and challenges um, when, when a free prior and informed consent compliance um, appears to be, have been obtained. But in actual fact, those who've been conducting the, the compliance have been too lenient about those elements about what actually constitutes adequate free prior and informed consent. Um, and I'll talk about some of these examples shortly, but. Um, FPP does, for example, um, work uh, with member-based certification schemes, such as the, the Forest Stewardship Council and the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. And they do have similar voluntary standards to those already mentioned by Kate, and um, they require um, FPIC to have been sought. But often those who conduct the audit to see if FPIC has been sought, and therefore that certification can be, can be offered to the um, investments and the development. Um, actually, the, the proper understanding of FPIC has, has, not been, um, has, has not been met and the audits will have been too lenient. And as I mentioned, another challenge for Indigenous people is ensuring that their systems of decision making um, are generally representative and made in ways that are inclusive uh, and accountable to members of their, their community. Um, and this can, can also create problems. So in my view, um, it's all the more reason that investors and lawyers advising investors and others should really consider compliance with free prior and informed um, consent very carefully. So the next slide has a picture of um, some land which is owned by Dayak Mayan communities in Borneo who have been in conflict with um, Golden Agri Resources, which as you may know is one of the biggest Indonesian palm oil producing companies um, and part of the big Sinar Mass conglomerate. And they've been in conflict for some years. So palm oil companies have long been criticized for damaging clearance of forests and peatlands. And one of the solutions can be to set aside um, areas within the concessions. But what often happens is that these concessions are handed out to uh, developers um, without first recognizing and securing the land rights of local communities. FPP has been working over the years with some of these communities to ensure that their land and other rights are respected, um, including the, the forest living Dayak in Indonesia. And some years ago, in 2013, uh, our investigations revealed that Golden Agri, Agri Resources uh, had not met RSPO standards 
which require members to respect customer rights and only take their lands having sought their ethic. Um, there are a number of issues, including that uh, there hadn't been proper participatory mapping of customary lands to identify uh, whose lands belong to who, so which lands belong to the, the Dayak. Um, they hadn't been choose, free to choose their own representative institutions within the negotiations, which is a problem I mentioned earlier. There had been some compensation offered, but it was of very little value, um, and it really didn't respect, respect the value or respect the indigenous, uh, uh, the land rights of, of the community. Um, the process itself wasn't fair. They didn't have a full understanding, um, and some of the community members believe that the, this would be a, a, a lease and the land would come back to them after 30 years, which wasn't in fact the case. And even worse, um, as far as we're aware, no one who actually sold on and surrendered their lands had, had a copy of the contract so they could understand their position and seek um, legal advice. Um, in addition, some community members agreed to surrender lands and others didn't. Um, and obviously, those who didn't agree to, to, to surrender their lands, they have the right to say no under ethic, um, but they've been subjected to sustained pressure, which has caused um, a lot of problems. And again, because the community was, was split, some were agreeing to pass on their land and some were not, that, that led to rifts among the communities. Um, so uh, FPP helped uh, the DIAC with a complaint towards the, uh, before the complaints panel of the RSPO which did um, hold that uh, GAR had not respected um, the community's ethnic rights um, and required GAR to make remedies for the land that were taken without consent. Um, but that hasn't actually led to any remedies. There's been, it had to be a further complaint lodged. Um, there have been some other, uh, numerous other complaints lodged um, saying that uh, GAR has been in violation of Indonesian land laws um, and similarly, that necessary legal, legal documents were not obtained. Um, there have been some concerns around use of shadow companies to conduct activities contrary to RSPO standards and international law, and even some allegations of, of bribery. Um, I think, you know, essentially, um, this, is a, this is a good illustration of, of a company that's using its RSPO membership to represent to investors and customers that it's behaving sustainably, um, but in actual fact, um, the truth is that, is that it hasn't. So I think it, it's a good illustration that human rights due diligence and, and risk assessment really need to look into what is happening on the ground. So the next slide is a picture of some um, land which 7,000 hectares of ancestral forest belonging to the Shipibo Kanibo indigenous community in Peru. Um, which has unfortunately been destroyed by a Peruvian company called Ocho Sopi, um, again, for production of, of palm oil. The community have been dispossessed of their lands. Uh, this has impacted food security and, and destroyed their, their way of life. Um, and they've been subject to intimidation, threats and attacks. FPP is working with the community um, to help uh, challenge the situation and help, uh, help uh, them seek the respect of their rights. Um, and in a couple of years ago, it emerged that um, Alicorp, which is a big, a huge consumer goods company in Peru, um, was buying palm oil from Ocho Zupi, um, from this, this plantation um, operating on, on the Shipibo Canibos people's lands. Um, but at the same time, uh, it had investment from uh, a Norge Bank Investment Management, um, who have expectations and, and documents and policies on human rights, which refer specifically to the standards set by the UN Guiding Principles and UN Human Rights and ILO Conventions and others. So uh, the Shipibo Kinibo uh, community and its allies, including FPP, uh, asked MBIM to use its shareholder influence to insist that Ali Corp. Uh, remove the Peruvian company Ochisupi from its palm oil supply chain. And in fact, they even went even further. And uh, earlier this year, um, MBIM announced that it had divested all of its holding in Anicorp with obvious financial ramifications. And actually, out of interest, there had been a complaint made to the RSPO complaints panel about this, but um, it had been rejected because Alicorp was a little bit too, too far down the, the supply chain. 
but what was good is that we were able to take um, other action to, to assist the Shipibo and Kinibo, um, community. So the, the last slide is of the Bagheli community in Cameroon, um, where there has, we are aware of two, uh, two, two developments um, which have been entered into illegally. Uh, the first is a presidential decree um, issued uh, granting Biopalm, a company called Biopalm, a provisional 50-year concession of 18,000 hectares of land um, on, on the Bagheli and other communities' land. Uh, so the communities found out about this concession uh, three months after the presidential decree was uh, was issued. They were not consulted. They were not informed. Um, there is no compensation being offered. Uh, you know, they live in a very, a very. It's, it's it's causing a big risk of grave harm and impoverishment, um, and and really affecting their livelihoods. And similarly. Um, there's been another another public notice issued um, last year, uh, declassifying what was already a forest management management unit adjacent to the Campoman National Park in southern Cameroon. Again, this is an area of traditional community use for the Bagheli and other communities um, who have already suffered through the creation of a park, which has uh, prevented them from accessing their their traditional lands, and there are other neighbouring palm oil plantations, um, and that's that's totaling 60,000 hectares. Um, and in the end, the forest management unit was unlawfully declassified um, and a, another company called Camver, uh, which is aspiring to RSPO certification, has been um, given the land for production. And uh, really, although it hasn't yet been formally allocated as an agricultural concession, events are moving very quickly. There's been preparatory work, um, starting to hire, hire staff and labourers. Um, unfortunately for the community, uh, there was a consultation which took place between Christmas and New Year at the end of last year uh, with fewer than three days notice. And obviously Christmas and New Year is a time where many accompanying NGOs and civil society representatives are unlikely to be available. So fairly obvious that free prior informed consent was um, all the standards were not meant there. Um, and unfortunately, um, that this, this may end up in some, we're working very closely with the community and this, this may end up um, with, with legal action. So those are a few examples and some context of some of the issues that, that may, may arise. But I wanted just to, to mention um, on my last slide, the, um, the concept of ground truthing, um, which is, there's actually a, a very helpful discussion paper on this on, on FPT's website, if you, you want to have a look. Um, but this is essentially the use of information about the actual situation on the ground, which is gathered from primary or secondary sources independent of companies in the supply chain or, or others. Um, and it goes outside of paper-based compliance and, and company self-reporting. Um, and it's a very useful tool because it's the people who know what is really happening on the ground are the local communities, are the indigenous organizations, are the NGOs and CSOs and, and the academic institutions, but due diligence and risk assessment is often just done on a desk-based, paper-based assessment. Um, so ground truthing can provide very valuable alternative and independent information about the operations. Um, and so I'd encourage you all to have a, have a look at that, um, that discussion paper. And I think also in that context, FPP and other NGOs who are working in this sphere, there, there are plenty of us, uh, who have a have a key role to play as a source of information and advice um, for lawyers who are conducting human rights due diligence or advising on investment contracts um, and and you know we'd be really happy to help so please do have a dig around on our website there is so much information on there and or feel free to contact us thank you thank you Lucy that's that's really great and it's really interesting to hear about the the practical examples on the ground um, there's also prompted a, a number of questions that, that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look to address uh, after I've just said a few words. And, and so just before we get to the questions, I've been asked to, to just put a, a few thoughts together about what we see in the law firm experience. Uh, and as I said, I, I'm, I'm a litigation partner, but I also do advisory work and work with my colleagues across our corporate department, projects department, uh, and the various finance divisions within Simmons. Uh, I, I was going to make four 
sort of separate observations, as it were, which hopefully pick up on some of the, the, the comments that Kate and Lucy have made. Um, the first is that it can be easy to forget that a law firm is itself a, uh, a business and that as well as giving out advice on these issues, we also need to make sure that we ourselves do not fall foul of the various obligations uh, that are at our honours, both hard and soft. And to that extent, I think certainly my experience has been that there is an increasing awareness amongst the legal community of um, human rights standards and obligations. Uh, I think that has accelerated recently uh, and certainly for my part and at Simmons we are involved in running internal training sessions about what the standards are and what's coming down the pipeline. Um, I think there is clearly quite a long way to go uh, you know across a number of firms um, certainly some uh, colleagues that I've spoken to in other firms are not so familiar with this uh, but I think that we are seeing that the educational gap is closing people are becoming more aware but it does raise some very difficult questions and some of the difficult questions have been flagged today um, and we'll come on to them in the Q&A about where exactly the line is to be drawn between advising the client using leverage uh, and, and acting in uh, best interests of, of client and also not exposing yourself to reputational risk or legal liability as a firm. Those are difficult issues uh, that haven't been fully resolved yet. The second issue I wanted to flag was, was actually what role we play in forming clients. Uh, and I think rewind 10 years ago, and many people perhaps in transactional groups may have seen human rights as a sort of uh, just purely a pro bono issue or, or not something with, that was relevant to their transactional day-to-day -day world. Certainly from what I've seen in my firm that that isn't the case now and at the very least people in transactional departments are aware of these issues and they're either able to uh, speak about them themselves and advise them themselves or at the very least know who, who to contact and bring into that dialogue. Uh, and of course the position now as has been mentioned by Kate and Lucy is that if you're advising on a transaction you know for example a purchase of a, a wind farm in in a third country it's no less relevant to think about the human rights dimensions of that acquisition and in this context land rights impact of that acquisition as it is to think about the reps and warranties or uh, the governing law clause or the tax issues or the employment issues then they're no less important and parties are beginning to understand that um, the process of corporate due diligence has been obviously ongoing for a long period of time in, in transactions but human rights uh, analysis as part of that corporate due diligence is getting increased weight uh, where uh, people who are potentially investing or acquiring projects and themselves now investigating in some detail the human rights impacts and not just what the factual position is but also the future litigation risks and, and I do quite a lot of work with our projects and corporate teams on precisely that. The third issue I wanted to flag was disputes experience and, and uh, how these issues are now starting to translate into legal claims. A point that has been made uh, quite rightly is that many of these obligations are not hard law they're only soft law or their guidance uh, but nevertheless we are seeing increasing amounts of litigation in this area uh, I think it's driven by several recent developments the first is the so-called Vedanta school of cases whereby the English court has found that at least there is an arguable duty on parent companies that they are responsible for the acts of their subsidiaries uh, uh, overseas and so we have seen a spate of cases in this country now where parent companies are being sued where things have not gone uh, right overseas many of those claims have been related certainly historically in terms of environmental pollution or in terms of child labor uh, but i think that increasingly you'll see that land rights form an aspect of those claims the second aspect of that is that um, third party litigation funding which has been around in the uk for about 10 years and has had very significant growth year on year um, such that in, in the last year I, I think there was 250 percent more litigation funding than four years ago 
Um, litigation funders are really interested in this area of business and human rights claims, which includes land rights claims. There is a huge amount of, of funding sitting there, and what that funding is used to do is to, is to finance the bringing of claims on a risk-free basis. So if the claim is lost, those bringing the claims do not have to bear uh, the legal costs. And we are seeing the money being deployed precisely into these sort of claims. And that, the, the fact that there is therefore an increased litigation risk on corporates, um, even if they did not want to uh, necessarily conduct good behavior anyway, is starting to focus the mind. And then the final point, which is, is linked to the last, is that actually we are seeing an increased focus on environment, social and governance issues more broadly. Uh, and, and I think it's fair to say now, given the number of inquiries that I get and the number of talks that I've done to corporate clients, this is very much at the towards the top of the C-suite agenda list of hot topics. I think before COVID-19, it was the top issue. Uh, and that's driven really by climate change and the environment. But now more broadly, uh, I think that is uh, including wider number of areas. And one of the interesting features, I think, as we emerge out of COVID-19, is that there is perhaps going to be an increased focus on ESG issues, but also on, um, on issues beyond simply the environment. I think, for example, um, one of the suggestions is that the deforestation and seizing of uh, indigenous lands and the turning over of that lands to, agri to commercial agriculture has led to a loss of biodiversity, which in turn has potentially led to an increased exposure to uh, virus and other pathogen risk. And so actually the COVID-19 crisis itself has created a real focus on land use. And it also follows, given what I've said about litigation and litigation risk, that therefore I think that is in the crosshairs of the claimants and the funders, and, and that uh, drives hopefully good corporate behaviours. In terms of the future, not only do I think that as we emerge from COVID-19, there's going to be more of a, uh, a focus on these issues, but also we are potentially starting to see some signs that we are moving more towards hard law regulations. So certainly we know that in the UNGP space that there is consultation about a binding international treaty, although I think uh, I think my view probably shared by those on this call that is some way away. The EU is also legislating on human rights due diligence and companies are also very mindful that as attitudes change and consumers and investors are demanding good compliance with human rights, with broader ESG objectives, that companies need to engage with these issues in, in order to uh, ensure that they both retain consumers and also investors. And uh, I think the example that uh, Lucy gave us about the palm oil case is a precise example of how that sort of leverage can, can have a real impact, particularly if investors then pull the plug on funding. Uh, so I, I think the direction of travel, as I say, is, is definitely a positive one. Being frank about it, not, not everyone is, is, is fully up to speed on the journey. Not all corporates yet see this as the top of their agenda, although, as I say, I think more and more corporates are. And um, in some ways, I suspect that as we see increased amounts of both good corporate practice, leverage and advice from law firms, particularly um, as wise counsellors, and cases against corporates leading to financial liabilities, then those laggards will begin to catch up. Um, but overall, I think the direction of travel is, is a positive one. Now I'll stop there. Uh, that, that leaves us some time for questions. Uh, Emily is going to, uh, she's been carefully sifting through the questions that have come in. And Emily, if you can help lead us through the questions, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, so um, starting with an insurers based question. So this is for Kate, um, although there will be one for Lucy as well. Um, so Kate, has there been any discussion with law firm insurers about your paper? Noting the UNGP is not of itself legally binding, nevertheless, are UNGP relevant to the standard of care? And would this come under a general public liability insurance or would it come under professional indemnity insurance? Um, I wish I could answer that question. I'm not an insurance lawyer. I think it's spot on 
because that is one of the areas which would potentially give this teeth is the insurance implications. I hope that people are looking at it. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know if there's anyone else uh, who can give more of you, Chris or, or anyone. Yeah, I, so I can give a little bit of context that I, I can't answer the question in terms of law firm insurance. Uh, what I can answer the question of, because I, I've been in to speak to a number of them and they've, they've asked for advice specifically on this, is the general risk to them, uh, both in terms of claims and also in terms of writing policies and coverage issues by policies already written on human rights issues. So it's definitely on, from my experience at least, on the, uh, on the minds of most of the leading insurers in the market. Uh, although I don't know about law firms specifically. I don't know if anybody else has anything else to add on that. Just, just one for, sorry, just one further thought. Of course, I mean, one of the aspects of this that I think is really important are the professional rules. Mm. And I think there is an evolution here that bodies are addressing business and human rights and law lawyers, and that is being integrated into uh, codes. There's a very good survey that was conducted by A4ID uh, I think looking at some of these issues that I've referenced in the guide. So in the, there are insurance implications of that and there are professional standing implications of that. And I think that is one of the ways in which this will have some bite. Uh, I'm not sure how much activity there's been on this yet, but where people feel that law firms may have breached their professional obligations um, because of they have these wider human rights obligations now, um, that, you know, that may also read across to insurance. Um, Chris, can I just chip in? It's Charles Saunders here. I, that was my question. Just say, I think that um, I'd be interested in Lucy's view on this one as well, because the same issue really does relate to some of the things that Lucy was talking about uh, with the verifiers. But um, just, just to note that 15 years ago, exactly the same conversation happened with climate change and climate litigation. And what really drove it was the reinsurance industry. Uh. And they got very, very interested in climate change because they were worried about litigation and then reinsurance litigation. And that in itself had a major impact. And of the early climate litigation cases, although most of them failed on substantive grounds, particularly the negligence cases, there was then a whole series of satellite litigation involving insurance in which it was held that climate change was reasonably foreseeable and therefore insurers were not liable to their clients for the uh, unforeseen event because it was foreseeable and therefore the polluters had to pay all the costs of the litigation which in turn started to develop the field of, of climate litigation so i think there's some interesting analogies for us definitely shall we ask the question to, to lucy now that follows on about insurance <laughs> Yeah, so <clears throat> Lucy, um, is there an insurance litigation aspect of verifiers of free prior and informed consent being unduly lenient on compliance and therefore providing negligent advice? Might the community have a cause of action? Yeah, so um, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not an, an insurance uh, person, but um, uh, I mean, I, thinking about it, I, c I can imagine that they could potentially be, be a, a cause of action. I guess what normally happens is that um, where it's through, you know, through a, a membership or certification body, you normally just go to the complaints panel. It's dealt with in that way. So there, I can imagine there might be some issues with um, kind of paper trails and showing what actually what actually happened and, and who you who you um you know where what the cause of action who the cause of action would be against um, um so sometimes that's quite difficult to get to get uh, evidence of and you know to, to understand the full paper trail um but was it i mean joss is a is a you you had asked that question as well so i don't know if there's something that you were you were thinking of there specifically yeah i mean if if you want to make a difference to the communities in relation to advice that's being given, whether it's in relation to land investments or whether it's in relation to due diligence, then one of the most powerful things is to hit people where it hurts. And um, that's their pockets. Uh, I remember uh, a, a talk about this nearly 20 years ago 
uh, by a prominent lawyer who I don't need to name, but he talks on this topic quite regularly, who said the very simple solution was um, to use Baroness Hale's phrase, sue the bastards. Um, and it seemed to me that, that there are a number of interesting angles here. There's the liability of the intermediaries, whether that's a law firm or a certification company. There's also the professional regulatory issue. And, and the other angle I was wondering about is, um, you know, so from the law, law firm perspective, and I have in my time been a partner in a law firm, it's about the, um, the insurance and whether law firms can get insurance for this kind of thing, or whether law firm insurance companies will say they're not going to touch it uh, because it's too risky. Uh, and therefore have exclusions in their policies, which in turn means that um, the legal advice to the land grabbers actually becomes very, very difficult. And then there's the professional regulatory one, which is, can you actually say that um, there are breaches of the uh, SRA or the equivalent Bar Standards Council rules, if lawyers, and this probably speaks more to uh, Kate's paper, but, but if lawyers are not complying with the UNGP, that a professional disciplinary issue. Again, you can you can make things uninsurable. You can make things unlegalable or unloyal. Um. Okay. So a question for Kate. Um. So this question relates to mining and lawyers advising mining companies. How can you ensure that corporate lawyers advising mining companies or oil companies meet their responsibilities as outlined in your presentation when some of those oil and mining companies represent the largest sources of revenue for some of those legal firms? I see a conflict of interest there and would be interested in hearing your views. Thank you. That's another great question. Um, and it raises lots of other, I mean, one area, related area I've looked at um, is, is on climate change, actually, and uh, fossil fuel companies where, you know, other related issues uh, arise on emissions and lock in stranded assets. And that's another whole set of issues. Um, I think we have to assume that the business and human rights agenda is uh, a genuine one and i don't say that because i've got rose-colored spectacles on but that's the world we live in so businesses are, have signed up to these standards states are obliged to um, secure these standards over businesses in their jurisdiction so i think the starting point is is what this system requires and this system requires you as lawyers to address these risks with your client, to advise on the law, on human rights law, as it affects the work that you're looking at. Obviously, those sectors uh, have other frameworks that are relevant. This is the, the guide that I've uh, worked on is about agribusiness investment, and it looks at those soft law frameworks and their relationship with human rights. It, it will be different for other sectors, and there's an interesting set of differences with climate change, where we have other binding treaty obligations. Um, it's a conflict, but it's one that you have to address. And I think the only way you can address it is by, as a law firm, having your policies in place, addressing this with the client at an early stage, making it clear what the scope of the advice will be, taking into account these responsibilities, and, and how you would address difficulties where they arise from perhaps milder difficulties of agreeing the scope of due diligence to uh, higher levels of difficulties where there are defenders, uh, reports of defenders being um, abused or attacked or other potential gross human rights violations. So I think that's, that's sort of where this guide comes from, that these things have to be addressed. What the law firm does in relation to clients where this is creating large amounts of difficulty, I mean, will depend on the, both the client and the law firm. But the human rights law is established. This is international law. These are fundamental international standards. And it is now accepted that businesses have a responsibility to respect that. And I think, if, you know, as Chris has pointed out, as Lucy has pointed out, there are increasing amount, uh, levels of scrutiny from a whole range of different quarters on this area. So this, it can't be ducked or fudged or swept away. And for a client, simply changing your law firm, for example, because they're giving you advice you don't like, is not going to solve your problem. It will probably make it much, much worse. 
Yeah, I mean, maybe I can add a couple of comments on that. Obviously, I spend most of my day-to-day -day job advising precisely the types of um, clients that were envisaging the question. Uh, so I, I guess I should be careful because I would probably be first in the firing line uh, in terms of, of what I've been advising. But certainly from my experience, I would say that uh, the companies in question are keen not to fall foul of these uh, these obligations, hard and soft, uh, not just because of litigation risk, but also because of the points I've mentioned already about investors and and the fact of their broader ESG agenda, and and perhaps increasingly the risk of, of director liability. Uh, it's not a point I, I made before, but it's not just the risk of a claim against the corporate, but increasingly against the potential directors themselves. Um, there are a number of challenging difficulties in some of the jurisdictions that these sorts of clients are operating in, of course. But as lawyers, our primary duty is to advise on what the issues are, what the law is, what the risks are, and to help the clients to um, work to uphold and implement the obligations that they are under. Um, it isn't always perfect, but were there not legal advice or, or were lawyers simply to walk away right at the square at the start because the client was from a particular industry type i'm not sure that would help to actually improve the overall picture for those clients uh, or, or be using leverage in the way envisaged by the ungps so it, it's delicate balance i think lucy i don't know if you have anything else to add to that or kate i think i'd, I'd like to make one follow-up comment which is sort of the most difficult issue perhaps lurking here or one of them is that is the logic of this that there are some investments that shouldn't be taking place and i think the answer is that yes there are some investments that shouldn't be made it certainly comes up in climate change but focusing on agribusiness yes i think there are investments that um, cause massive damage to biodiversity to forest peoples and others if you look at the FAO guidance, there is a strong push against large scale land acquisitions that affect indigenous peoples with customary rights and so on. That doesn't decide every case. There may be middle ground, but I think we can't shy away from that. These systems that in this sector, land and human rights, there will be cases where the investment should not go ahead. The FAO guidance makes this clear. There are some red flag situations where there are indigenous rights, where there's post conflict and others where there should be extreme caution. And I think we shouldn't shy away from that. It may be difficult for the client to hear that, but that is the reality of these standards and the effective protection of human rights and other issues, but biodiversity and climate change that have been flagged. And I mean, the IPCC has just produced a special report on land that makes it clear that we have to rethink our global uh, model for agribusiness because our land use model is simply not sustainable in climate change terms, let alone, you know, human rights protection and biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, I Thank you. Um, so actually, another one for you, Kay, which I think um, follows nicely on from um, what we've just discussed. Um, are there any alternative or additional perspectives on the role of the lawyer uh, where the lawyer is in-house um, rather than an external advisor? Um, the, the guide uh, also addresses um, in-house lawyers to a degree, and there are some separate guidance uh, of in-house lawyers. I think the IBA guidance does touch on in-house lawyers. They obviously have a different relationship, but in terms of um, checking that human rights due diligence is taking place and having proper policies in place, for their for their business i think they do have responsibilities but obviously their responsibilities are within the operation of of that business so it is a slightly different relationship they are an important part of the business getting its um its compliance right so if you look at the guide there are specific um recommendations for in-house lawyers but but they don't have the, the dual responsibilities they obviously have some professional obligations but they are mediated by the fact that they are in-house. Thank you very much. Um, Lucy, question for you. Um, are there examples of free prior and informed consent where the community has withheld consent and the project has then not gone ahead, i.e. the lack of consent leads to prevention of action? 
Yes, thank you for the question. So I, I was thinking about this, and I'm, I'm quite sure there are examples, and um, I'm sure FPP has some, and I, I don't immediately have them at my fingertips. I, I guess the issue is that quite often FPP gets involved where, or, 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 or others get involved, other organisations, other lawyers, etc., get involved where, there, where a conflict has already ar arisen. So um, where perhaps uh, ethic hasn't been sought, and then, then, then we come in to kind of um, help resolve the issue. Um, I mean, I can think of some examples where um, ethic has, uh, and following you know principles of ethic, has actually led to successful benefit sharing agreements. So I'm thinking of, um, and, and Chris may, may know some of these. So thinking particularly of, um, uh, it's more around tourism, but in Tanzania where there have been some successful agreements. Um, made between uh, supposedly sustainable tourism companies who have uh, evicted indigenous peoples from their lands and then actually um, it's led to a resolution and there's a, an agreement um, and the communities actually get you know some benefit and but they still get to use the land so that the conflict goes away um, and uh, I know that we're also working for example at the moment with another um, community in in Peru um, where the development is proposed but it hasn't gone ahead yet and we have been helping them to uh, organize themselves to decide what they want to do with this community following principles of self-determination to develop advocacy positions and also to um, uh, speak with and, and negotiate with with the um, with the investor so um, I mean, it, it, the short answer is yes, I'm sure there are, but I, I'm much more aware of, of things where perhaps you get, you get an, an, an agreement or perhaps where, where things have, have, have gone wrong. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, another one for you, Lucy. Um, what happens if there is a disagreement between traditional indigenous leaders and elected indigenous, indigenous leaders in relation to FPEG? Does one prevail over the other? So uh, it's a little bit hard to say because there will be there will be every every community will have sort of different systems of of leadership and different systems of of decision making. Um, there isn't one kind of you know unique system. Um, I think uh, what's important to remember is the principle of self determination here. Um, so that that there may be in this situation there may be some elected indigenous leaders who have perhaps been elected according to, to national law or perhaps um, uh, local law, the way that, uh, the way that um, there, is, there is local governance. Um, and that may be in conflict with, with traditional, the more traditional systems. Um, certainly what we would encourage is that the traditional um, indigenous uh, leadership should, should prevail. Um, but it really it's down to the community to decide um, themselves respecting the principles of self-determination, which which one should prevail and come to an agreement themselves. And the stance that FPTP takes is that um, we will offer advice and support and guidance, but it would really always be up to the community themselves to, to decide um, decide any conflict between those two, or, or you know, at numerous levels of, of decision making. And that actually created a real practical difficulty in the Maasai case when we did negotiate a settlement agreement, which you've alluded to, Lucy, because one, one of the, the key, I mean, um, practical questions is, is who, who is capable in the community, who is authorised to execute that agreement uh, on behalf of the community as a whole? Uh, and and that, that was a difficult issue mm. um, and, and actually took quite a lot of discussions on the ground in, in, the, in the community talking to people, uh, including through uh, translators, to try and establish who, who was the right person or persons in that situation. And I mean, the agreement that we executed has been broadly successful, although as time goes on, you know, one hears about incursions and, and people not upholding their end of the bargain, etc. So not absolutely perfect, but um, at least some positive development. Yeah. Um, and finally, a question for both uh, Kate and Lucy. Um, what teeth do these provisions have when, uh, if I understand correctly, the legal obligations in relation to human rights are excuse exclusively on states, not corporate bodies or individuals? Um, shall I, I'll have a go and then I'm sure Lucy will have sure. something to say. I mean, I think the whole business, the whole area of business and human rights has to engage with that. And I think it's moved a bit beyond saying these are purely state obligations. That is, 
the point of the UNGP. They are sitting in this evolving area. Obviously, there is a push for a, for a treaty on that, um, which I imagine will happen at some point. Um, but leaving that aside, I mean, there are clearly legal consequences for breaches of human rights standards. Um, depending on national law, they will vary. But increasingly, you've got sort of due diligence type laws that you have for certain areas in France, in California, and in other jurisdictions. As we've already touched on, there may be insurance implications. There may be, I think there are likely to be implications under professional standards, and that will have not on effects on, on other areas um, and there are tort claims I think this is a the area of lawyers liability is perhaps underexplored I and mean, lawyers may be comfortable with that but I think it won't remain underexplored you know the, the focus that there has been on the financial sector uh, the role of banks and lenders is now rolling across to lawyers and law firms so there is the evolution of business and human rights law and the sort of harder edged obligations of businesses under the international framework. But while that is evolving, there are definitely these other sets of consequences under, under national law, I think. Uh, I, I mean, agree. Uh, go, go on, Lucy. Sorry. Yeah, so, so just to add to that, I mean, I can think, you know, human rights implications have other implications under, under law. So if you have uh, 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 an investment that has resulted in, in evictions and um, property right violations and others, then it's, you know, it's possible to bring national litigation. Um, Chris also talked about uh, the Vedanta type litigation, which has been brought um, under, under tort. Um, you know, if, if, similarly, you know, investors can, can pull the plug, as I talked about in my, my presentation. And I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that um, strategic human rights litigators are, are quite inventive. <laughs> So this will continue to kind of evolve um, and there were always, you know, we've had some suggestions from, from Joss around looking at the insurance litigation aspects as well. So, you know, I, I think um, even though technically these are voluntary standards, there, there will always be um, ways around this, whether it's national or, or um, yeah, regional human rights litigation, etc. Um, it, it is possible um, through inventive litigation to bring, bring corporations to account. And it's particularly true, I think, where corporates have put out statements saying they are going to comply with certain aspects of the UNGPs or other obligations and then have positively not done so, whether that failure to live up to a published statement and therefore the losses and potentially expectations that are born from that can themselves give rise to a, an independent cause of action. Uh, I've been in one claim where that was pleaded, although the claim resolved before trial, so the issue was not tested. But that 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 is definitely uh, an issue that's going to be explored in litigation in due course. I think that may bring us to the end of the questions. Emily, are there any further questions? No, I think that is everything. Wonderful. Well, in which case, it, it just falls to me to to thank our our two experts, Lucy and Kate. Thank you both very much indeed uh, for your really uh, interesting insights and, and the work that you're doing in this area. Uh, thank you also to Lawyers Against Poverty. And as you can see on the slide, the contact details are there. For anybody who isn't a member, uh, I'd strongly encourage you to, to join up. And also thank you to uh, Emily for hosting and for dealing with the questions. And finally, thank you to everybody who joined uh, the discussion tonight. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, certainly, uh, I, I thought it was very interesting to hear the insights uh, of, of the speakers. And we look forward to seeing you again at one of the next seminars that we'll be running. So thank you, everybody, and good evening. Yes, and thanks. Thank um, you very much, everyone. One of the, the next event that we, that LAP is looking to um, hold, which will hopefully be in mid-July, uh, will relate to um, COVID-19 and Oxfam's response to that. So uh, details will follow. So we hope to see you at that. And thank Great. you very thanks, much. Emily. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good Thanks, evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.